picture from the Pearson textbook, uh, not the Cambridge textbook, but it's a good picture that shows the difference between monocots and dicots. So we have the one cotyledon, we have the flower parts, but the ones that Cambridge care about are leaf stems, and roots. Roots, shoots, and leaves. So our leaf veins in parallel, our leaf veins are reticulated. Our vascular bundles complexly arranged, our vascular bundles in a ring. A adventitious root system and a radical root system. This is our major differences. Let's talk for a moment about the transition zone. The transition zone is a zone where the root becomes the stem. This often coincides with where the, sh where, where the plant comes out of the ground. So uh, this is where the main vascular bundle in the root will diverge into multiple vascular bundles in the stem of the dicot plant. So this image, this image sums up pretty much everything that we've discussed so far about vascular plants. And you're going to go ahead and pause the video to take a good long look and good. All right. So let's talk about vascular tissue. So this is the vascular longitudinal section. We have xylem, we have cambium, and we have phloem. What we notice about the xylem and the cambium and the phloem is, first off, that they are having movement inside of them. The cambium looks pretty much like your stereotype plant cells. Um, and that the different complicated, the different substances, the different cell types in the tissues. Xylem, it looks like, doesn't have very much in the way of anything really that's like a cell. Whereas phloem, it's got stuff, it's got empty tubes that are similar to xylem in a way, but then it has companion cells as well. Let's take a closer look. Xylem is dead, and phloem vessels are, well, zombies. Zombies that are sort of being fed by companion cells. Very Shaun of the Dead, if you will. All right, so uh, xylem vessels, let's talk about those for a moment. Your smaller xylem vessels are your tracheids. Your tracheids or your tracheary elements. Tracheids are these small xylem vessels. They are hollow. They taper and angle at the ends, and then they uh, structurally, they will overlap like so. This is to prevent uh, side shearing forces. Um, and then we have the large phloem, uh, the large xylem vessels, the large xylem vessel elements, where you have no end walls no end walls, or at least the remnants of end wall, uh, you have some remnant of the end walls in here. Uh, and there is no end walls between these cells, and you have a thick, stiffened wall uh, that has been thickened and stiffened with lignin. Lignin is a, uh, another substance that is neither uh, protein nor carbohydrate, but when you add lignin and cellulose, you get wood or wood. So, in your xylem vessel tracheids, in your tracheid vessels, you have these perforated end walls. Now, understand, having no end walls is what allows water and mineral nutrients to flow through the xylem. It's really hard for water to move through a closed door. It's also uh, really difficult for water to move through any sort of completely blocked off pathway. So a perforated end wall or a lack of an end wall is going to be your, uh, your way through, your path forward. Having a continuous xylem vessel is your plan. Now, the phloem vessel, the phloem vessel elements are sieve tubes. These are uh, filled with degenerate protoplasm. And uh, large protein fibers are not thought to be present in them. Uh, and basically, the movement of assimilates and substances and water and fluids through the phloem vessel elements, uh, through the phloem sieve tube elements, excuse me, uh, can go in either direction, up or down, but only in one direction uh, 
in any one sieve tube element. Now, the direction of movement in the phloem is always from source to sink. These phloem sieve tubes are going to be assisted by companion cells. They will always be assisted by com <coughs> they'll always be assisted by companion cells. Um, now, companion cells will store food, uh, and they will also uh, unload and load uh, sucrose in that cell. <clears throat> Phloem C2 elements will have uh, end wall perforations to allow for the flow of uh, phloem sap. Now, those are broad strokes overviews. Let's take a closer look. Xylem consists of hollow, non-living cells. The walls between the cells have broken down, creating a hollow continuous tube. Large, vessel, uh, large and small vessels, the small vessels are called tracheas or tracheary elements, and some xylem tissues within the vascular bundles contain air spaces, which you can identify by a ring of cells rather than a continuous thickened wall. Let me draw that for you real quick. So you have a xylem vessel element, like so, which has its own thickened wall, versus an airspace where you have multiple cells ringing and opening. So when you have multiple cells in an opening, that's an airspace. As compared to a single continuous thickened wall. Now the function of the xylem is to transport water and mineral root nutrients from the roots to the stems to the leaves. From the roots to the stems to the leaves. From the roots to the stems to the leaves. And if that's not stuck in your head by the end of this video, I don't know what will be. All right. Now, phloem sieve tubes. Now, the composition of a phloem sieve tube is that it has degenerate protoplasm. It will lose the majority of its organelles. It will have some scant endoplasmic reticulum. It will have some mitochondria. Uh, there will be some ribosomes in there. But its nucleus will be gone. Its, um, its nucleus will be gone. Most of its larger organelles will be gone. Uh, that's in order to save space. It needs that space to move substances, to move those assimilants. The walls between the sieve tubes have been perforated by small pores. This allows the passage of manufactured food, typically from the leaves to other parts of the plant. But any source of food to any sink for food will work. Typically, we're talking about sucrose and amino acids here. Um, now, they're technically not dead. They're not hollow. So transport is occurring by diffusion and active transport rather than pressurized flow, as in the uh, xylem vessel elements. Now, my apologies to any trigophobics out there, uh, but this is the internet. You knew what you were getting into. Uh, now, this is a sieve tube element. This is the lumen. This is cut along right around here. So we can see some of these examples of sieve tube plates. These are sieve plates. And these perforations are what allows this degenerate protoplasm to flow through from one sieve tube element to another. Now, a companion cell. A companion cell will be a smaller nucleated cell adjacent to the sieve tube elements. These are metabolically active cells. They keep the sieve tubes alive, the sieve tubes lacking their own uh, cellular machinery to sustain their own existence. They're also assisting in food transport and food storage. Now transport by performing the uh, active part of active loading. Uh, and food storage by unloading and active transport and all that other stuff. Now, let's identify some of these tissues. Take a moment. What kind of cell, what kind of tissue is this right here? If you said, Flow, you were right. 
for those of you playing along at home and not skipping to the end like some kind of animal. All right. Now, what kind of tissue is this? If you said xylem, you were right. Now, what kind of tissue is this? If you said airspace, you were right. Now, let's move on to identifying these tissue types themselves. Let's identify individual cell types. So, what kind of cell is this right here? If you said companion cells, you were right. What kind of tissue type, what kind of cell is this? If you said flown sieve tube elements, you were right. What kinds of cell, uh, what kinds of uh, cell, what kind of tissue types are these as the whole of this? If you said the xylem, you were correct because all of this is xylem. This is a xylem vessel, but this is an airspace. So all of this, this entire space is the xylem tissue. <clears throat> what kind of tissue is this? All of this. If you said phloem, you were correct. What is these right here? If you said xylem vessel elements, you were correct. What is this right here? If you said airspace, you were correct. Now, once again, what kind of tissue? Phloem, cambium, xylem. What kind of tissue? A is a tracheary element or a tracheid. B is a cambium cell. C is a phloem sieve tube element. And D is a companion cell. And E is a xylem vessel element. Now, Let's talk about the movement of water through plants, which is really what this unit is all about. Although identifying tissue types... Okay, yeah, a lot of questions can come from identifying tissue types. You got me there. All right. So, the cell here has a water potential of negative 500 kilopascals. If you're wondering what the heck a kilopascal is, it is a unit of pressure. It is 1,000 pascals. Pascal is a unit of pressure. So, it is bathed in pure water with a water potential of zero kilopascals. Now, if you remember our previous videos, water will flow from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential by osmosis down its water potential gradient across a plasma membrane. So, Eventually, water will enter the cell down the water potential gradient. If we had a pair of adjacent cells, one with negative 800 kilopascals and one with negative 1500 kilopascals, the one that is less negative is the higher water potential. Less negative. Less negative. From now on, less negative equals higher water potential. Less negative is higher water potential. Less negative means higher water potential. I want that to be an instant translation. I want that to be an instantaneous conversion in your head. So, the less negative number, the higher water potential, is negative 800. And the lower water potential, the more negative number, is negative 1500. Water will move by osmosis across a plasma membrane into the intercellular space across another plasma membrane from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential from the cell with the higher water potential to the cell with the lower water potential. Now, if our environment 
is more negative, if our cell is less negative, that is the movement of our water from the cell to the environment, from an area of high water potential to low water potential by osmosis across a plasma membrane. If our environment is less negative, from an area of high water potential to low water potential by osmosis across a plasma membrane. If we are talking about cells and ignoring the environment, from an area of high water potential, less negative, to an area of low water potential, less negative, more negative. When we have the environment at negative 1500, and the cell at negative 700, and the other cell at negative 700, these two cells will be at equilibrium. However, the environment, water will flow by osmosis from an area of high water potential in the, first ce in the cell adjacent to the environment to the environment down its water potential gradient. Water leaving the cell will lower the water potential inside the cell. It will decrease the water potential. It will decrease the water potential inside the cell. And now negative 700 will be higher than the than the water potential in the first cell here. And we will have water move from this cell into this cell to try and re-reach equilibrium. And then this movement will continue until all three are at equilibrium. The same is true here. The environment is at negative 300. Water will enter this cell from high concentration, high water potential to low water potential, raising the water concentration, water potential inside this cell, high water potential to low water potential, chaining water potentials. This idea of chaining water potential is the idea behind transpiration, the movement of water from an area of high water potential in the soil to an area of slightly less high water potential in the roots to an area of slightly less high water potential in the vascular system to an area of even less high water potential in the stems to an even lower water potential in the leaves to an even lower water potential in the mesophyll to an even lower water potential in the air surrounding the leaves. This chain of water potential will draw water from the ground into the tree, up the tree, into the leaves, out of the leaves, and into the atmosphere. This is the idea that drives all of this transpiration.